Okay. Welcome to Change It Up Radio here with Paula Shaw. I am so delighted that you're joining me today. We are, as you know, in the midst of COVID-19, and so we're doing things differently. We record now on Zoom, and then all the other stuff is put together afterwards. So bear with us. <laughs> Some of you will be hearing a little bit of chit chat maybe in between segments, which will of course all be edited out before the final airing of the show. This is Change It Up Radio, and as most of you know, we are here on AM 1170 and FM 96.1. We are all about change. Our goal on this show is either to spotlight change makers who are trying to make the world a better place, like my beautiful guest today, Jennifer Myers, or we're about bringing information to you that will help make change smoother and more productive for you. This show uh, is, is dealing with a subject that I think is so important right now because everybody on the planet is going through change. Right? This pandemic, COVID-19, has changed so much about the way we do life. And, and we humans are not crazy about change. We have a love-hate relationship with it. You know, on the one hand, we, um, we need it. We like something new to be happening. On the other hand, we hate the discomfort of the unfamiliar. And so change and the upheaval that it causes in our lives can be a very, very difficult circumstance for humans. And so here at Change It Up Radio, we just want to make that easier for you. We want to inspire you with some of the change makers who are doing things out there that are helping us all. And we want to give you that information and, and those tools that can help you when you're going through change and upheaval and you don't really know what to do. So I think, as I was saying, many people are looking at change right now because We've, we've got, what do we call it now? Well, shelter in place, lockdown, quarantine. There are all different levels of what we're having to deal with. And basically, to some degree now, we're all dealing with a level of incarceration, right? I mean, obviously, we get to leave when we need to, most of us, though in some countries in the world, you can't go out in the street without a good reason or the right paperwork. Here, at least in California, where I am, you know, my neighbors and I are out walking all the time, keeping our six-foot distance, but it's there, but there are restrictions, right? You can't go meet somebody for a coffee or a glass of wine. You can't go to dinner. There's, you know, you can't even really go to your friends' homes for dinner because that's not the responsible thing to do because none of us knows who the others have been in contact with. So we're needing to be responsible now for the greater good of all. You know, as Bill Gates said in a quote recently, that it's the greatest act of love and solidarity on a global level that has ever been seen by this generation. And that's pretty huge, I think, pretty huge for all of us. You know, one of the things that I have been reading during this time is a newsletter being put out by Mariette Formo, who is the leader of the program I work in, I, many of you have heard me talk before about the Brilliance Inside program that I work as part of in Donovan State Prison. And my guest today, Jennifer Myers, is also one of the people working with that program. And Mariette, who began it, is uh, during this time, she's putting out a newsletter that she's calling Thrive While Confined. And, and that's what she's talking about. And what I'm loving about it is she's using stories and, and teaching points from the guys on the inside because they're experts 
at dealing with confinement, aren't they? They're experts at trying to turn this confinement, to transform it into a gift for good. And that's what we've been talking about all along here on Change It Up Radio is instead of whining and crying and looking at all the negatives about what we're going through right now, let's find the gifts in this. Let's find the parts where we're going to be richer on the other side of this. I love that line I read online that said, um, when all, I think that when all the dust settles, we will all know better how much we have, how little we need, and that human contact is all that really matters. And human connection, that's the word, connection, not contact. But I love that because I do think that out of this time, we are seeing so many beautiful acts of kindness. We're seeing humans who are going out of their way to think about others, to act for others, to take care of others. There's a lot of great stuff going on during this time, which many of you know I've been focusing on in a little segment I do on Facebook every day called 1130 at 1130, Highlights from the Silver Linings Playbook. And it's been such a great thing for me because I've been forced to get online every day and look and see what are the good things that are going on out there. What, what is the positive that's coming out of this? What are humans learning? How are they growing? And that part just lights me up. It makes my heart so happy because there's a lot going on out there. And, and part of what I, I have been giving a lot of thought to is this, this circumstance of incarceration, both because I work with men who are incarcerated when we're not in the middle of COVID-19 and because I've been you know, reading some of the things that Mariette has put out. And, and my guest today is really kind of an expert on incarceration. You know, she knows a great deal about it from both the inside and the outside. But I, in doing a little homework to prepare for this, I have to tell you, I was kind of blown away to discover that 219,000 women are incarcerated here in the U.S. And this was a statistic that was from November of 2018 from the Prison Policy Initiative Report. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The rate of female incarceration now is at an all-time high. There are 133 incarcerated women for every 100,000 women that exist here in the U.S. And, and here's the really amazing thing to me. The U.S. accounts for about 4% of the women on the whole planet, but it accounts for 33% of the women who are incarcerated. That's huge. And, and this seems to be a result of the war on drugs. Many of these women are in jail for uh, drug-related charges. This was pretty amazing too, that um, the women of color are making up the biggest percentage, twice as many Hispanic women and four times as many black women as white are incarcerated presently. And, and, and one of the other things that makes it so difficult, and this is something I'm looking forward to being able to speak with Jen about, is because the, the rates of women who are incarcerated are rising, they're having to put some of them in facilities that were designed for men. So they're not even adequate for women. And so we've got some, some real problems going on here because one of the things that we know and one of the, the reasons I work in the program I do and, and Jen, Jennifer, who's going to be joining us shortly, does what she does is because we are trying to help people change from the inside while they're on the inside so that when they come out, 
and they're back in society again, that they can be successful, that they can be productive members of society because the recidivism rate is huge, both with men and women. A huge amount of, of people, once they're released, end up committing some sort of crime that brings them back to prison again. And that's just not a good thing. That's not working. What it's saying to us is that we have to find more effective ways to rehabilitate these people. We have to be helping them change the way they see themselves, the way they see life, what they're experiencing, both emotionally, mentally, spiritually, on all those levels. We have to help them get to a better place before they're released. Because when they are released, it's not easy. Many of them come out and they don't have anything. They don't have family. They don't have a, a, a place to live. They don't have a car. They don't have um, training to really do a job that's going to help them create income. And so circumstances just get worse and worse and worse and they end up falling back on some sort of criminal activity because that's what they know. That's what's familiar or because they wander into settings where people that they used to know who are engaged in criminal activity still are. And, and when we get into that environment and we're desperate enough, then unfortunately that does not lead to good outcome. You know, the, the guys in our program, which is called Brilliance Inside, have made a statement that I think is so true. And what they have said is that we are all one bad decision away from being in prison. And I think that's pretty huge. You know, the way you grew up, you're going to hear from Jen. She grew up you know, like the girl that looked like everybody's favorite next door neighbor, you know, the, the one who was going to be the young yuppie wife and have the perfect life. She had all the pieces in place, but it didn't all come together the way we would have thought it would. And we're going to find out why in just a moment. So stay with us. Jennifer Myers will be joining us in our next segment. All right. Be back in a moment. All right, and for you live stream viewers, we're not really going to be a moment. We are coming back right now with Miss Jen Myers. All right, <clears throat> welcome back to Change It Up Radio. We are talking about female incarceration today and prison rehabilitation efforts. And I am thrilled and delighted to be able to introduce you to my friend and amazing human being, Jennifer Myers, who will be joining me in this segment. So let me tell you just a little bit about her. And I'm going to slip my eyes on here so that I can see. She is an author, a speaker, and a federal prison coach whose fervent desire is to bring an end to our country's mass incarceration problem and to find alternatives to imprisonment. Her passion is to be an advocate for women in prison and youth with incarcerated parents. And this led her to become the founder of RISE, R-I-S-E, Rise to Empower, a nonprofit dedicated to empowering girls and women to make positive choices. Uh, this program has been accepted into San Diego's U.S. Federal Probation Reentry Initiative, where they facilitate high-risk women recently released from federal prison. Jennifer's written a memoir called Trafficking the Good Life, and it's gotten amazing awards, and has, she's had articles and bits of this book, I imagine, too, we'll have to ask her, published in Salon Magazine, Razor Wire Women, The Huffington Post, and she speaks extensively to teens and women about making good choices 
She's done a TED Talk. She's been on Today, on Good Morning America. The woman's a superstar. So without any further ado, please join me, Jennifer Myers, my dear friend. Hi, Paula. Hello. Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, I am so delighted that you're here because I think the story that you have to tell is huge and important, and I want you to tell it. So I think the most important thing we could do is go back to the beginning. Tell them a little bit about how you grew up. You weren't somebody who grew up in a horrible neighborhood with uh, drug addict parents and all of that sort of thing. So tell us a little bit about how did you grow up and what was life like for you when you were young? Um, I had a great childhood. Um, I'm, I was really lucky. I mean, I had parents that loved me. Um, my mom and dad were not divorced. They were together. Um, I grew up on a farm. So I lived in the country. My father was a farmer. My mom was a school teacher. And, you know, from the young age of three, I was put into gymnastics. Um, I eventually was on a gym gymnastics team and I competed nationally. Um, I took dance classes. Um, I later taught dance classes to kids. Um, I was an honor roll student, um, captain of my cheerleading squad, um, voted most talented out of my senior class. I, <laughs> I wow. had a great, wonderful upbringing. Yeah, the all-American perfect girl. It, it seemed like it. I mean, uh, I maybe that's what I was sort of striving to be. Um, mm. A very happy childhood, though. And, and so then what happened? Did you go to college? Did you, what, what I did. happened? Yeah, I, um, you know, I made the decision to pursue my dancing career. And I auditioned for the Ohio State Dance Department and I made it in and I was thrilled. So I went to Ohio State, which I followed in my family's footsteps. My, my, my mother, um, my father, my grandmother all went to Ohio State. And ah. um, I joined a sorority there. I was a Pi Phi and it was my, I was a, a legacy. So my mom was a Pi Phi and I loved everything about college. Uh -huh. um, I was in the dance department, um, in the dance department, and in I made the dance company. So we would perform and choreograph. And then after I graduated, I moved to Chicago and I started a career dancing and choreographing. Wow, fabulous! So that's what you were doing as a profession. Well, I was. I mean, you have to understand though that being a dance a dance major and a a modern dancer never makes a lot of money. So literally, you, you do the love of your art is, is yes. you do it because of that. So I was working a full-time job and dancing and, re and rehearsing oh, on the side. My it, goodness. Yeah, it was a lot of work. Yeah, I was going to say, so you had a huge schedule. Must have been busy from the crack of dawn until you collapsed in bed at night. Mm -hmm. But I loved it. <laughs> and were you happy? I was really happy. Um, I, I, I think you're looking for the turning point. Exactly. I'm thinking, well, so <laughs> where did it go wrong? So, so, you know, I can just share with you. I was, I was happy. I think I was frustrated because I was working so hard and not mm -hmm. making a lot of money. And, you know, I guess I just was like, well, what's next? You know, where do I yeah. go from here? And, it, you know, it was a little bit of a struggle. Um, and at that point, my sorority sister introduced me to a guy and she said he was he was fantastic he had money he traveled a lot and and she knew I wanted to meet somebody that was a really good guy and I'd had some struggles with relationships and I met him and he was fantastic and he was a great guy mm -hmm. and um quickly I got very much pulled in to this relationship very fast um to his lifestyle which was a, a completely higher lifestyle than one I'd ever had. Mm -hmm. um, he was a great guy, but I allowed myself again, like many women's stories that are incarcerated, there's usually a man behind it and I take full responsibility, but it happened way too quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and then one night, um, I, I didn't, I just thought he was an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And one mm -hmm. night he tells me when we're sitting beside um, the water in Chicago, and he tells me that he's been running a marijuana trafficking ring and that the, the Mexicans have taken somebody's son and they kidnapped him because they owed um, over half a million dollars and that he needed to find the money by the weekend. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 
So that was the turning point. And I, I didn't leave. I guess I, I cared about him and I thought, well, marijuana is, is not, you know, that harmful. Mm -hmm. My friends smoked it um, and I wanted to help him. So I stayed. And, and then you became involved? I got involved. I mean, at a certain point, now two months down the line, I saw how much money he was bringing in. I felt tied to him. Now I, now I wasn't sure about the relationship. I jumped in way too fast. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I want my own money. And I take, again, full responsibility that I asked to get involved. And, and I started driving marijuana with him across the country. Driving it. So you had it in your car and were driving it across state lines, apparently, right? Yeah. Well, first it was a car, then it was a van, then it was a U-Haul, then it was a car trailer, you know, up oh, until wow. we were transporting 9,000 pounds of pot across the country. Oh my goodness. Wow. And, and were you ever scared when you were doing that? Were you afraid about getting caught? I mean, I probably should say yes. I mean, a part of me, of course, it was, it took a lot of adrenaline to do it and you had to be sure. focused. And I'm not sure why. I mean, maybe it's my naivety. Um, I felt safe with, with, let's, you know, with Dale, the guy that I was driving with. And, and I guess I, I'm not sure why I wasn't as frightened. I was really able to stay calm under pressure, but it was a lot of pressure. And, you know, Dale always said to me, don't worry if anything happens, you know, call this attorney who I knew in LA. So I never knew about the mandatory minimum guidelines. I, I had no idea about the federal laws. Ah. At all. At all. And so there you were. And what happened? How did you get caught? So, I mean, this went on for about eight years, um, oh. nine years. Um, at certain times I got out and I stopped and then I would get pulled back in. And the time that it happened, I was actually living in San Diego, it was in 2002. And I had been asked to rent a storage unit to store the marijuana before an Atlas van truck would take it. Somebody else was transporting it. So I did that. And, you know, I made some money. And then, you know, I did it a second time. And the second time, um, when the Atlas van truck would, went to Detroit, somebody got arrested. So I got a phone call two days later and said, somebody's been arrested. And at that point, I was petrified. And okay. I had no idea what was going to happen. And three months later, I end up getting arrested at the real estate office where I was working. Oh, my goodness. So you were selling real estate at this point in time? I was doing real estate investments. I was, I was I renovating. Yeah. yeah. All right. And so they arrested you. And what happened? <laughs> How long was it until they incarcerated you? Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was two and a half years, took two and a half years for me to get sentenced. Um, yeah, it was, it was a pretty awful experience. I mean, it took, you know, when I was arrested, um, I was, you know, and the funny thing is the reason why I was arrested because of the storage unit, I didn't know, but the DEA, you know, they were watching the storage unit and I had called the storage unit and I had said, um, I don't want, I don't want what's in the storage unit. And, and they said, well, why not? And I said, because you know, I, I don't. And they kept pushing me. So I lied. And I said, well, because I'm going out of the country. So the funny thing is, that's probably the worst lie that I ever could have said. Because oh, the next day they came to arrest me because they thought I was going to flee the country. which oh. I had. So it took two days for my friends and families to write letters for the judge to allow him to release me on bond. And then I was released on house arrest. I was on house arrest for over a year. Um, and I was facing 10 years in prison. So I was stunned when I found that out and, you know, felt sort of silly and stupid and naive anyways. Um, but yeah, it was really, really challenging. And there, during that time, I was stalked and, um, and bribed by the other people that were involved in the conspiracy to not cooperate, which I wasn't doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it ended up that um, my boyfriend who had gotten me involved, we were no longer together, but he actually turned himself in and then proceeded to wear a wiretap and got um, everybody else indicted. Oh my goodness, this is like a movie, <laughs> like a definite movie. So, all right, so let's go to the part, and you're sentenced, how long did you actually get sentenced for? Very lucky, um, I ended up getting three years. Um, I cooperated eventually because everybody else did too. 
um, cause Dale had turned himself in. So it was really the only option at that point. Yeah. Um, so my deal was to get three years and I went in, um, I went to federal prison camp Alderson and I ended up luckily only serving 17 months. I'm very, very lucky. Hmm. And is that because of good behavior, because you were doing programs and that's no, no, not at all. I mean, I was in the RDAP program, which is the only way that you can get a reduction in your sentence because I, I trafficked marijuana. I got approved for the drug program, mm -hmm. um, but I got out even sooner. I got out on immediate release because of my cooperation. So um, yeah. one day, you know, there was a call that came through and they said, you, you have to be off the prison grounds in seven hours. So that oh, was gosh. in itself. Um, <laughs> A very interesting day. <laughs> oh, I'll bet. I'll bet. And isn't it ironic that you went to prison at all for something that today is legal? You know, and I'm sure a lot of people have that story. And and maybe are still in prison, right, Jen? I mean, if you had 110 percent there are still people incarcerated. It is not retroactive. I mean, the laws are still not clear. It's still not necessary legal and federal, um, you know, federal and states at war. And yes, no, it's not. There are people inside. There are people on my case. Um, there's one man that got 25 years because he was a two-time offender. Oh my and goodness. so he's still inside. I mean, oh. it's, it's, it's the system has a lot of kinks in it that do not work. It definitely does. And yeah. we will get back to this amazing, riveting story in just a moment. We come back from this message. Hang on, Jen, stay with us. We'll be right back. All right. All right. I'm going to just bring it back, Jen, because we're not really going to a message right now. <laughs> okay, here we go. <clears throat> Welcome back to Change It Up Radio here with Paula Shaw. My guest today is Jennifer Myers, and we are having an amazing conversation about female incarceration. If you missed last segment, she was talking about her own experiencing traffic, her own experience trafficking marijuana. And we are right now about to talk about what happened when she was sentenced and actually did go into a woman's correctional facility. So Jen, Tell us now, you, you've been sentenced, you said you got a three-year sentence, but you ended up only having to serve 17 months. But, you know, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are wondering, and certainly I am, what is it like for a woman who is in a woman's prison? Yeah. So, you know, first of all, it's very interesting because before I went in, I was desperate and searching online. Um, for some support. And I found a man at the time named David Novak, and he was a, a prison consultant. And at the time, there were only two prison consultants around, and that was um, an attorney, I think Alan Ellis, and David Novak. And um, so I called David, and, and he began to share with me what prison was like and to be a support. And so I was lucky to at least feel like I had some some sense of reality check, mm -hmm. um, that it's not just like what you see on TV or sometimes what the media portrays. So, so when I went in, I have to admit, I was ready to do my time. It had been a long time of waiting and that was basically hell for me. So I went in, I think for the first couple months, I was in shock. Um, I was in a camp. So luckily a federal prison camp is the lowest security prison you can be in. Ah, you know, okay. if you go up to an FCI and medium security federal prison, it's much different. Um, so I had some freedom of movement. Um, you know, we, we lived in ranges. So basically at Alderson, you know, there were ranges, which is one big room um, where 150 women live in one room and there's cubicles um, that go down without a wall that goes, you know, only like a cubicle wall. So if you're on the top bunk, you can see the whole entire room. So one, two, three, four, there were eight different ranges. So at Alderson, it was a very big federal prison. There was about 100, uh, 1,600 women on the compound in a prison that's only supposed to hold 1,300 at the most. So it was very overcrowded. And what would happen because it was overcrowded, well, we always had what's called a bus stop. So in a women's federal prison, same for men, the bus stop are beds that are out in the open. So they're literally like, you know, 
four feet away or a little bit more from the officer station. There's an officer station that sits up front and you'd have to change out in the open and like hide under your nightgown and change. And you know, there's male guards in female prisons. So oh the, yeah, the, because prisons are overcrowded. So at one point the prison was so overcrowded when I was inside that they made a double bus stop. So now literally there were 16 women out in the open with their beds about this far away from the officer's station. Um, and that's where I slept for six, for six weeks under fluorescent lights that never turned off. Um, there's something called the fishbowl, which is another room they shove people into when it gets overcrowded. Mm -hmm. And I just remember like, every 10 days there would be a group of women that got shipped in on what we call con air you know from county jail or transported on a van and just a whole nother string of women coming in and it's like 20 more new commits and it's you're right it's because so many women are getting incarcerated on non-violent drug crimes and if you think about it not that they're not responsible there's usually a man behind it that's why there's so many women getting indicted and for especially like my generation, we were conditioned to, to let a man lead, you know, to do what they thought was a good idea for us. Younger women, I think today are thinking much more for themselves. They're stronger, but there still is that generational thing, right? That, that, that maybe we're hardwired to still on some level, let men lead. Well, or we do things for love. I mean, you know, honestly, yes. you know, that's, that's a huge part of it, you know, yes. or, you know, there was a woman beside me who was in for 10 years, her son had used the phone um, to do a drug deal and they indicted her, her and she had, oh. she didn't know anything. So she couldn't cooperate and she didn't want to cooperate against her son. I mean, there was a lot of times families were pitted against each other. Oh, my goodness. So what were the other women like? You know, we've we all seen the movies or the women that are in their hard asses or their, the, you know, the whore with the heart of gold character archetype. What, how did you find the other women? So, you know, honestly, I, I, I made some really good friends inside prison. Um, yeah, there were some rough and tough women. And that's just without a doubt, it's prison. And yeah. women that I never had like been around before and and I felt afraid of and um but ultimately I started realizing you know hey if I was respectful followed the rules um you know I found the women that I wanted to hang out with nobody was going to hurt me you know unless I did something to hurt them mm -hmm. um but I oh my best friend Erica um was 19 she was the youngest you could be as a felon and she wow. came in she had never been in trouble before um, started doing meth and started cooking it in six months. And before you knew it, she had a federal indictment. She had grown up Pentecostal. So she, anyway, she was the sweetest girl. So um, we became really, really close. Um, you know, I hung out with, you know, women who were, you know, had been CEOs, presidents of title companies. Yeah. You know, down to, yeah, I mean, there was, there was a, a mixture of women inside. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, ultimately, Women, you know, like to take care of each other. They like to nurture and they do that inside a prison. That happens. Oh, that's good. That's good to hear. That's really good to hear. So, so after you served your time, Jen, you had a big commitment in your heart when you got out of prison. Let's talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, my prison experience was, um, it, it really struck me and, um, you know, I was, I was deeply impacted by it, um, by all the women that I saw and met who were incarcerated on these long nonviolent drug crimes who were mothers. I mean, literally two to three children. And I really was just done. Like, this is just one prison camp. There's other prisons. And so something needs to change. And all I knew was in my heart, I just, for some reason, latched on to my, my destiny, a purpose, and and hit the ground running when i got out on fire like i didn't know how i was going to do it but i wanted to speak out yes. and make a difference so it took a few years for me to get on my feet i mean i didn't have anything i didn't have a car i didn't have a job um luckily i had my family's support but you know i wasn't doing it fast enough like everybody it was so interesting is everybody um 
wanted me to be somehow different and just to move forward in a different way. But I had changed. Prison changed me. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is interesting about the, um, the virus and the coronavirus is that, you know, within these times and moments, we change right, and right. we're different. And so I was different. Um, but anyways, it took me a while. About two years later, I started writing my book. And I finally eventually got my book published um, called Trafficking the Good Life, which was my story. And after I got that published, things just started clicking into place and taking off for me. I mean, I started speaking with the Tariq Foundation, which is Stopping Youth Violence. Um, I started speaking to kids in high schools about making good choices. I did that for a couple of years. And then I met a woman, Amy Wise, and we decided to found a nonprofit and to write a curriculum um, eventually for at-risk youth to help them make good choices. And then it's a program that's now being used for women coming out of federal prison. So that's sort of the line that started happening there. I so love that you work with them, uh, with the youth. So let's start with the youth because Obviously, the idea is let's get people on the right track, the right thinking, loving themselves, having confidence, believing in their ability to make good choices when they're young so that they don't fall under the shadow of some guy who wants to use them for profit. And I think that's so great. And I also love the idea of working with the women, a place for them to go when they come out so that they can get a good start and be successful. So tell us a little bit about how you do that. Yeah, so, um, you know, when I started with the youth, it was working with at-risk teens, and we actually were funded by what was called, what's now called Momentum Learning, which was a school system in San Diego that includes every child that's not in regular school. So there's hundreds of school sites of kids who are not making it in regular school. And mm -hmm. the first place that we did our program was at the Lindsay School. And that was a school for teen moms. So we were working with a group of, of you know, vulnerable women who mm -hmm. had, sometimes parents were incarcerated. Maybe they'd been in juvie, they had children. Like, so that was really, really powerful. It was a part of their curriculum and they received high school credit for it. Mm -hmm. um, then we went on to Monarch, which you probably have heard of Monarch, the homeless school in San Diego. Oh. Um, and we did it as an after school program, which was harder because our program is a three month intensive program. Yeah. And you work it on your own, you know, four to five days a week. And then you have a, a circle like we do going to Donovan, going deeper. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a commitment. Mm -hmm. um, and so eventually, a few years ago, um, a probation officer from US federal probation approached me, contacted me. And her name's Michelle Pearson. She's a go-getter. She's amazing. And for free, she started diving in to try to, you know, find other programs for women coming out of federal prison who needed programming. Because there's not money. Federal government has no money for programming, hardly at all. Oh, so she read yeah. our program, as you can imagine, top to bottom, and she loved it. So we did our first program two years ago, working with a group of high-risk women, you know, coming straight out of the ground. Some of them are completely, you know, in halfway house. Um, most of them are mothers. Some had been sex trafficked or involved in the trade. Um, and all of them were looking for jobs, to reconnect with their children, for housing. And we just started our second group right before the virus hit. Um, I think it was in January we started. So we're now doing Zoom calls with them. Oh, that's so cool. And when we come back from this message, let's talk a little bit about that program and what you're doing in the program at Donovan State Prison. So we will talk about that in just a moment when we come right back. All right, Jen, if you're ready, we're going to come right back. <laughs> Great. Okay, ready? <laughs> Welcome back to Change It Up Radio here with Paula Shaw. I am having a riveting discussion today with Jennifer Myers. We're talking about female incarceration and really incarceration in general and how to avoid it, how to help people who have, who have ended up incarcerated to change, to be able to really change in meaningful ways so that they 
when they're released, they never come back again. So Jennifer, let's go back to, you were just talking about RISE, which is the nonprofit you founded that helps both teenage girls in programs helping them to make good decisions and also helps women who have just been released from incarceration, right? Right, definitely. All right, and this is going on in several different locations, I gather, correct? Um, right now, we're working with San Diego U.S. Federal Probation. So that is where we're honing it in. Um, I'm in discussions to bring the program to the Juvie School in San Diego. So, I mean, the Juvie, the Juvenile Center. Uh -huh. So I have a meeting soon with that, and I'd love to bring it to Las Colinas. So it's growing. Oh, that's so exciting. And who teaches your program? I do. You do? Um, I, I do. I teach it with a couple of different facilitators. Right now, I have an expressive arts therapist. I think you know her, Laura Lee. And okay. um, Jessica, who um, is getting her, um, uh, her doctorate in clinical psychology, and she was actually a clinician doing her internship at Donovan. So they are right now facilitating with me. So there's three of us. And you were mentioning at the end of our last segment, you're continuing the program, even though we're all dealing with COVID, you're doing it on Zoom these days, right? We are, we're on our third call. So that's super exciting. Because yeah. as you can imagine, the women are dealing with a lot right now. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yes. I mean, you know, I think about our guys every day, what it's like there, you know, how, how are they implementing shelter in place or social distancing or any of those things there? And, you know, I, I have no idea. <laughs> They're not, but okay. I'm anyways. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I'm sure it's very, very difficult. You know, even the fact that you're living in a cell in very close proximity to somebody else, you know, is not something they can probably change. But let me ask you, uh, yeah, I'd like to talk a bit about what attracted you to now working with men at Donovan state prison, but what kind of results are you getting with the RISE program? What are you seeing in the young gals and in the women who you work with when they get out of prison? So, so what, um, what I feel like the, um, our RISE to Empower program does is, is similar to what happens with the men inside Donovan. It really brings the women in back to a sense of self-value. And, and what would happen in our program is that, you know, it, because we try to really hold a very non-judgmental space, yes, you know, yes. I don't have a, a, an agenda of what decision I want them to make. Um, basically, you know, I just want them to understand that they actually do have a choice. Right. And through that, you know, they really start to feel empowered to make their own decisions. They feel yes. valued and then they start supporting each other. So it's pretty powerful. We've had women come out um, who are, are um, getting straight A's in community college. Another woman got a um, year internship working with the homeless, and now she has a full-time position. Um, now she speaks up and supports other women who are being sex trafficked. Um, we do have our success stories. Um, you know, that's, I mean, women reconnecting with their kids. Um, it's, it's powerful. Um, you know, when we were working with the teen girls, we had one girl um, you know, who was actually living across the border with an alcoholic family, and she made the decision to transition into housing that was safe and protected when she was in the program with us. And I think it's because ah. she felt strong enough during the program. Oh, beautiful. Those are just some success stories. Wow. Such, yeah. such deeply rewarding work that you're doing. I think it's so beautiful. So now that you've created all this great stuff with the girls, and by the way, I want to let everybody know you have an amazing TED talk where you tell your story online that they certainly want to listen to. But now I met you in a program where we work with men. So how did that come about in your life? No surprise, surprise. You know, I've always, I was always saying I'm, I'm, I'm the oh, woman. We're all about the girls. <laughs> all about the girls. And I actually, um, you know, I was doing some speaking and I met um, the organizer, um, the TEDx organizer of San Diego, Mark Lovett, ah. and at a speaking workshop. And he's like, you have to meet this woman, Mariette. Because as you know, Mar Mark helped Mariette, you know, in the beginning, go into Donovan and start the TED TEDx program. Ah. So I met her, we went for a walk and 
put in my clearance and I said, you know, hey, because I had tried to get cleared to go into the women's prison, um, Las Colinas, three years before and they denied me. So, you know, I couldn't even get into prison. So Mariette was the way and she got me cleared. So I'm like, yay, I'm going into prison. And I was excited mm -hmm. to do it. And, but surprisingly it was a male prison, but I'll tell you, I'll never forget the first time I went in and Billy, this, this awesome dude, you know, walks up and, and walks with me down that long walkway, you know, to the activity room. Yeah. And he was just so smiling and he's like, tell me about you. And he sits me down. And he's like, I want to hear all about you. And you know, that was just the start of it. Like once I was in, I never looked back. It, was it, he one yeah. of the, was Billy one of the residents? Yeah, yeah, Billy was one of the residents. He was uh, one of the original core team. I mean, I've seen like three teams go through, so. Oh, um, that's and I, cool. Yeah, yeah, and I think for me, I was surprised. And, and what I realized is, it's, I think personally, um, even though it can be challenging, it's really important for women and um, to come into men, to men's prison as volunteers, um, you know, whether they need to, you know, project you know, their mother wounds or their sister wounds, or, yes. you know, we all need that match. And I have received so much from going inside and being with the men who I honor and I value. And, and let alone that, I've gotten a fondness in my heart now for, you know, sentencing policy around life sentences and, you know, um, um, juvie LWAPs, life without parole, which I do not agree with. And so the men that I've met, the heroes that have been incarcerated for so long are, are what's real are the are the ones that we need to bow down to because they're doing the work. But I don't have to tell you that. They are. You know, I have shared on this show before, and I will say it again, that if I met any of the guys in our Brilliance Inside group, if I met them outside of the prison setting, I would say, and I do say this is true inside or outside, they are some of the smartest, kindest, most giving, thoughtful, generous men, lovely, sensitive, expressive men I've ever met anywhere. And, and let me preface that and just, I want to say, because I don't want it to get distorted because it's very much true, is that the men that are come into our program want to change. They have a desire to change. Some of them have been working on it for years. Yes. Some of them change when they're inside with us, which happens too. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if everybody inside prison on medium and right. max yards are like that. Right. But what I've discovered, if any takeaway I have about prison or the men that I work with, or is that when you make the decision to transform inside a tight container like prison, magic happens. It, it, it creates like the most magnificent human beings. Wow. That's a beautiful, incredible statement, Jen. And I, boy, I, I support it completely. And, and while, you know, I, I know I have caught myself before in, in exactly what you were just saying, I realize that not everyone in prison is like the guys we work with, but what I see in the guys we work with is what's possible. Yeah. And the right program, the right motivation, and the right inspiration all come together. No matter what the crime, this human being can transform. Yeah, and that's what restorative justice is about. I mean, right? I mean, it's about, for me, why the program works inside is, it, again, bringing value to people that feel undervalued and devalued. Yeah. And so to yeah. me, value is, is, is the secret formula for change inside prison. Mm. And, and you, you know, I, I just want to kind of recap for our listeners. You started in a prison situation yourself, vowed upon your release that you were going to do work to help other women who were in that situation, especially now that you had more insight as to who they were and what they were experiencing. And look what you have done over the years, your book, your work, your nonprofit, your work in Donovan. It's so beautiful, Jen. And it, and it, it just speaks so much to who you are and what you bring and why I feel so honored to know you. 
Well, I want to say thank you for saying that, but I have to say it's it's not me. Literally, I just made the choice to keep saying yes over and over again. I mean, <laughs> I am being led by something so beyond me. I so I, I can't. But thank you for saying that. Um, and thank you for what you just said. That's so beautiful that you're being led by something so much bigger than you and beyond you. And what a perfect place to just say bless you for blessing us with your story and your presence today. And I'm so delighted you're in my life. And I want to thank all my listeners who are here to, to hear this amazing story from Jennifer Myers. And don't forget, we will be airing this show on AM 1170 and 96.1 FM on Sunday evening at nine o'clock. It will also be on every major podcast platform and on our Change It Up Radio website at changeitupradio.com, as well as our Change It Up Radio YouTube channel. So share with others Jennifer's story and let them hear this show. Please share this story because we need to let the world know there's some amazing beings in prisons and we need to open our hearts and create beautiful programs that help them step into who they really are. Yeah, and before we go, thank you for having me on. And I have to give a huge shout out to every single guy in our program. In yes. case you're listening, we are thinking about you. I, we miss you. Um, we'll be back. I'll be back. And just, just, I'm just shouting out to all of them. So Perfect. And <laughs> my shout goes right with that. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Bless you guys and bless you all. Take care of yourselves and stay safe. We'll see you next week on Change It Up Radio. Bye-bye. Are we going off live? We are in a minute.